Hi everybody, so if you think about it in a certain way, wind turbines by their very nature are inspired by nature. Their designs and concepts are pulled from the world around them to optimise their efficiency, reduce their impact and improve the energy that they produce. The turbines mirror the form and function of things around them in order to perform their function better and better. So biomimicry or inspiration from nature is ingrained in what turbines actually are. And of course nature serves as a treasure trove of designs for engineers to look at, trying to replicate the efficiency and the elegance of forms found in nature. Biomimicry in wind turbines revolves around imitating shapes, structures and behaviours observed in nature's aerodynamic wonders. Of course, birds with their innate ability to navigate wind currents have long inspired wind turbine designs, and some blades incorporate features from the bird's wing, altering the blade shape and reducing disturbance in the blade path and improving efficiency. The swaying motion of trees in the wind has influenced flexible turbine designs that can adapt to changing wind conditions. Mimicking tree flexibility, these turbines can withstand strong gusts without sustaining damage and thereby ensure longevity and stability. The unique fins of whales, optimised for hydrodynamic efficiency, have inspired turbine designs with smoother edges and curved shapes. These adaptations reduce drag and noise, enhance turbine performance and minimise disturbances to the surrounding ecosystems. There are four main benefits of biomimetic wind turbines. Enhanced efficiency, reduced environmental impact, improved adaptability and noise reduction. Of course, despite the promises of biomimetic wind turbines, challenges are there. Replicating intricate natural designs into functional scalable turbines while maintaining cost effectiveness is a serious hurdle. And of course there's rigorous testing and validation which are crucial to ensuring the efficacy and safety of innovative designs. But the future does hold promise. Ongoing research in biomimicry coupled with advancements in materials science and engineering continues to push the boundaries of what wind turbines are capable of. New collaborations between biologists, engineers and renewable energy experts foster this innovation and driving the evolution of nature-inspired turbines. And this was sent to me by a friend of mine and it was a, a website, I'm oh, sorry, a YouTube channel of a Finnish artist called Simon Grippenberg. He's got about a thousand subscribers he gets a couple of hundred views per video. But I had a look at this video and, and it was about a frenet heater being wind driven. And I'm going to do a separate video on that because it's a fascinating idea. But I also had a look at his channel. And um, he does some awesome stuff actually. It's one of those things that you kind of have to dig around on YouTube because it's <laughs> quite a lot of junk on YouTube, quite a lot of false information, quite a lot of scams and quite a lot of clickbait. But there is some brilliant information if you have a dig around. Now, I didn't dig around from it, my friend did, okay? Um, but I went to this Simon Grippenberg's channel, had a look at a couple of wind turbine designs that he's got that kind of hit a note with me, and this one particularly I liked. And I thought I'd give that a go at replicating it. So, what I've come up with is a stick <laughs> with a bit of wood on it. This stick has got um, this circle of wood and in there I've drilled straight through two holes. That hole goes straight through to that hole and then 90 degrees exactly the same thing and I've got a couple of bits of this. This is fiberglass rod and the rod can go straight in there and swivel around the same axis and that seems to be important. Then I've taken some aluminium sheet and bend it over because that will then glue on to that rod like that. That goes in there and then the other piece goes on at 90 degrees. So it's at 90 degrees like that. So I'm going to get that built. There we go. That's what one blade looks like on these two. They're free to swivel on each other. Okay, so that's it mocked up. Now, the blades are like that. You see it's 90 degrees or like that, it's 90 degrees. And we've got them offset against each other and they're fixed on the same axle. So I think the idea as it turns, that gets hit by the wind and presents that surface and it gets pushed as it's doing that, this one is levered up to present the least amount of surface so we don't have much drag on here and we get a bit of push on there. 
I think that's the idea, okay? And as that one comes around, the same thing happens, and so we get it to rotate. So I've got a fan on it, so that we can see it happen. Now, I think that works that way because it's spinning in that direction. So if it worked the opposite way, we would expect it to spin in the opposite direction, I think. But it's certainly very interesting. We've got a wind speed about 1.5 meters per second there. So this is the kind of wind turbine that's dominated the wind industry, well, since the 80s really. Now before that, wind turbines were very little more than propellers that they'd robbed off aeroplanes, and they had two blades on them, and they were effective rather than efficient. And it was a Danish inventor, Heinrich Steisdahl, who had a look at this and came up with this three-bladed design. And this three-bladed design is more efficient and more stable, and so it's become the dominant design for wind turbines right up to the present day from about the 1980s, and it's called the Dutch concept. And of course we're always looking for improvements on things and where can we find those improvements from? One way is to look at what we've got and make it better and better and better. Another way is to look somewhere else to see if there's something doing something that might be interesting. And of course, we're in the autumn, and in the autumn, you're going to find a huge amount of these kind of things. This is called a Samara. A Samara is the group name for it, actually. This is from a sycamore tree. Uh, Samaras include things like sycamores, uh, ash, maple, honesty, hops, those kind of thing. And a Samara can either have its seed at the end or its seed in its centre. So seed in the centre is things like hops and honesty, and seed at the end are things like ash, maple and sycamore. So this Samara seed, of course, will do something extraordinarily interesting, and that is when you drop it, it will rotate. And of course, that's made it the inspiration for single-bladed helicopters. A whole range of things are being inspired by this. And I was thinking, as we look at this, how frighteningly similar it is to the fin of a whale, so it must have hydrodynamic properties. But at least we'll be able to look at the wind, because the movement is relative. If I move this and the wind is still, or I move the wind and this is still, it's exactly the same thing in terms of the relative movement. So if we fit that to an axis and have wind blowing over it, we should be able to get that to turn, and of course that is the big question. There's something else really interesting to notice about it. Here is a wind turbine blade, and you'll notice it's actually more like a wing, a bird's wing. It's thicker down here and thinner up here, so it looks very similar to a thing like a gull's wing, perhaps. This one is actually the other way around. It's thicker here, actually it's thicker more in the middle, there, thinning out to the top, and then very thin there. So it looks like it's inverted, and of course that has got to be interesting. The first thing we need to do, clearly, is make a model of that. Now we could try and model it, but of course we've got a scanner. So what I'm going to do is scan that in. Once we've got that scanned in, of course, we can clean it up with a bit of editing software. And I'm using 3D Builder, not for any particular reason, it just came with the computer, and so why not? Once we've cleaned that up, then we can get that into Tinkercad, and in Tinkercad, I'm going to play around with it and put a little peg on the bottom so that we can stick it into something. And then, of course, we can print it off, and there it is. <laughs> and she looks remarkably like its original, so I'm quite pleased with how well that turned out. So this is our 3D printed sycamore seed, or Samara seed, and we can print three of these to put it in the same configuration as the um, Dutch concept. Why not? We want to have a bit of a comparison. So we need three of these and a nose cone. So there's our three blades and our nose cone that they fit in there. Of course, I'm going to put this on um, Thingiverse so anybody who wants it can help themselves and feel free. Now, there's a huge discussion about which way around these go. Do they go that way? Do they go that way? Actually, it doesn't matter. If they go that way, they'll turn clockwise. If you go that way, they'll turn anti-clockwise, which I think is hilarious. And there are my three 
Samara Sycamore Siege glued into the hub and I've added a piece of 8mm steel bar. It's 200mm long because I've also created this handle. All we're going to do really is hold it in the wind to see if it works. <laughs> which, you know, is win enough at this stage. To make that turn, there's a couple of bearings, one in either end, and they're 22mm by 8mm by 7mm skater bearings. What you do is take an 8mm washer, stick it on the end there, then put your handle bit on. And what the washer does is stops this rubbing against the case or against the outside of the bearing. Then another washer on the back, and we've got this little plug there that goes on and holds the whole thing together and stops it coming apart. So that makes me a little handle, there we go, where I can hold that in the wind and we can see if we can actually get it turning in different orientations. So let's get it out in the wind. Okay, I appreciate that that's only a handle and not a generator, and we're really just getting a sense. I mean, it did turn in that orientation, but clearly it was much better that way around, and that's the way around to use it. So this design seems to work actually relatively well, and a ballpark kind of idea, but we've got to put a generator on that. But there we go. That is the design for the propeller blade of the uh, Samara Seed wind turbine. So we took this, a sycamore seed, scanned it in, replicated it three times and printed out that. Now, it worked quite well, but there are little issues with it. And the issue with it is if you look here, that blade actually has a bump in it there that's out of line with everything else. So chances are it's going to cause turbulence. I would have liked to have taken that out. And then, of course, we added the tubercles to it by putting lozenges along the leading edge. But those lozenges, uh, well, they're bumpy. And so without a doubt, the airflow over here is a little rough. And of course, they're just a gap along the leading edge. And there's no effort to make a little curve in there because I can't do it. I don't have the programming skills to be able to draw that properly enough. Now, the purists among us will say, well, just learn them then. And that's a very valid point. You should just learn them. But I looked at Blender, and Blender is universally understood to have what's called a very steep learning curve, which is just a kind way of saying, if you want to spend two years of your life learning your program before you can use it, choose Blender. No, I'm not going against Blender. Blender is an awesome program. It's used for oh, millions of things. You can use it for making your own animated films. You can use it for uh, doing 2D drawing. You can make brilliant 3D models. It's awesome, and it is everything to everybody, but it's also very complicated, very scary, and takes a long time to learn how to use it, and I don't want to do that. I'm not I'm not sure why that makes me a horrible person, but I don't want to. I want something that's much more approachable because there are lots of times I'm coming across these little issues that I want to clean up. So, for example, this is the Ingenuity Blade, and we scanned that, and here at the trailing edge, it gets a bit thin for the scan to be able to cope with it, and so it's got little lumpy bits and tiny holes that are basically left alone, and so there are faults with that that I would like to rectify, but don't have the programming skills and the drawing skills to be able to do it, and don't really want to spend years learning how to do that. I want something that's intuitive to me, and luckily enough, of course, there is something that's intuitive to me, because there is something called Sculpt GL. Now, Sculpt GL is probably the Tinkercad of the modeling world, and it's very intuitive. It takes as its idea you have a ball of clay. That ball of clay, you're able to shove around. Okay, go to a web browser and type in Sculpt 
GL. Hit enter and it'll take you here. Now scope GL, that will start it immediately. You want that one. Click on that one and it will give you the scoped page. And here you can see that you can actually download it because this is a web browser application that works online as its primary source, but you can download it and run it locally if you want to, so you don't have to have the internet. It will still present itself in a web browser. Now it's so intuitive to use and so easy to use that this will work on your phone, it'll work on a tablet, it'll work on a PC, it'll work on a Mac. It's absolutely brilliant. But if you want to use it in the web, then you just jump to the web base one. And to get there, just click there. And that'll take you straight in and there it is. So we go back to our web browser and here's the first page we looked at and we clicked on that one which took us to the home page. If you click on that one it will jump you straight to the program and there it is. And presented in the first opening with this ball of clay. Now I don't intend on this being uh, a tutorial really because on the home page if you look here you find a set of tutorials of this YouTube channel, click there, it'll jump you straight there where there are some awesome tutorials. So I don't intend on going through this. We're going to use it to actually modify our Samara seed blade to something that we want. So let's go straight in there and have a look at that. This ball of clay we don't really want. So if we go to scene, we can clear that scene, in which case it will delete the ball of clay. And there we go, we've now got a blank scene. We, on the scene again, we can add a sphere, which was the ball we started with, a cube, a cylinder, or a torus, and then all the lumps that we can actually start with in order to model some awesome model. But we want file import. So we go to file import and add OBJ, SGL, PLY, or STL. Those are the files that we can add. If we click on that, it'll take us to the one that we want, and we want Swanky Crift 2, which is an odd name for this, but that's still the name. And there is our Samara seed, the one that we had problems with, and that is the dip that I've been burbling on about. Now if we go over here, then we get this sculpting and painting tools, and really we're going to move this around like a lump of clay. Because the first thing we want to do is push that out as if we were pushing it with our finger, so instead of brush where we're going to lay things on, what we want is drag. So if we hit drag, we'll be able to push that as if we were pushing it. So if we go over it and then push it, it will push it out. That's so cool. Equally, if we go here and push down, it will push it in. Now you'll notice there's actually two red dots appearing. That's because we've got symmetry turned on. If we turn symmetry off, then we'll only get one red dot that's appearing and we can push with that one red dot on the area that we're actually interested in. I've got the grid showing here, let's hide that grid. And there in scene, we've got show grid, let's turn it off and we've got hide grid. In order to move in and out of this incidentally, I use the scroll wheel on the mouse. In order to spin around it, then either right or left click and you can spin around the model by going to different places and just spinning it around. If we want to move the actual model so that we can get closer to it, hold the Alt and then left click and drag. And what we're actually doing is moving camera position, but it looks like we're moving the model. So we can move the model and then we can zoom in on a particular portion that we're interested in. Then without holding down the Alt, we can spin it around and we can see how jagged that actually is. To remove that, what we want is the smooth tool and then we can smooth that area just by painting over it. Again, as if we were pinching it. <laughs> that is beautiful. And then we can just smooth those edges to make them nice and smooth. Again, if we go out and we spin around the model a little bit, then if we get a lumpy area, we can choose to flatten it, or we can pinch it out, or we can smooth it, or we can do something called inflate. Inflate is where there's an area that maybe is a bit thin for you. So for example, here, let's inflate that. And then if we hit the inflate on there, what it'll do is act as if we're blowing behind the clay and we'll fill that area out.
and we can thicken up our leading edge by doing that. And if we feel that's a bit too puffed out, of course what we can do is flatten it. And then we keep on doing that, dragging, pinching, flattening, smoothing, just like you would with plasticine or clay to get the shape that you want. So let's do that. Okay, so this bit is actually magical. If we hit the smooth and then we can smooth over the area, you can see all those nasty little lumps and creases disappearing as we smooth it. Now you can change, you just look at that red circle, that's the radius of the smooth brush we're using. And as we use this slider bar here, then we can change the area of the red circle and that's where the influence of smoothing will be. And this is true for all of the brushes, so we can smooth a huge area. Okay, it's quite addictive, but once you've done that, of course, what you'll get is your rectified STL file and that's our 3D model that we've smoothed out. Now we've pinched out the trailing edge so it's sharp, We've inflated the leading edge so it's got a bit more of a cut in it and then we've smoothed all the edges out so it's more like a blade and less like a sycamore and it's much more even so of course we can now export it. We export it by saving it as an SDL and there it is saved. Now let's print it. And there it is printed and it looks very much more beautiful indeed. This is nice and thick like it should be, this is nice and thin and as this was printing I checked the wing profile and it's much more like an NSEA airfoil than it was here. And we've also taken this drop out here a bit so that we've got a nice curve on there. So very much nicer job. Of course what we want to do now is this one here which is very lumpy and of course I've done that and this is what they look like in comparison. So I want to print this one out and then we'll get a nice look at that because this one is obviously a bit of a blade in general and this one is one of the things I want to test. So these two blades of course I will be putting them on Thingiverse in case you want to have a look at them, in case you want to play with them. But the whole idea has been to use that Sculpt GL to take out the things that we can't get when we're doing combinations of scanning and modelling to make them very much more organic in their approach and presumably would perform much better. Now this idea of sculpting in clay as a process is in fact gaining a lot of ground when it comes to 3D modelling and the things people are doing with it are just amazingly well incredible really and it is super intuitive it was i don't know 10-20 minutes before i was using that program it took me an hour to learn how to use the cursor in blender 20 minutes later i was producing something in that program so it's well worth giving it a go and adding it to your armory now without a doubt there's always going to be people who say why bother just learn one program and sure but the problem with a blender program or a program like blender is it's just too much. You're just never going to use those things because all we want to do is smooth out a few curves. We don't want to make a two-hour animated film of all the characters that we've generated. And for that, something like Sculpt GL is another string to your bow. Pointed out how similar this was to the shape of a whale fin, particularly a humpback whale, with the exception of the leading edge being covered in little, little bumpy bits, and those bumpy bits are called tubercles. And it does make you ponder whether those tubercles in fact have a function or they're just bumpy bits. The first person to ponder this was a marine biologist called Frank Fish. And with a name like Fish, you really have to end up being a marine biologist, don't you? And he asked himself the question of what effect that would have on the whale's ability to swim and turn and be aerodynamic in the water and he got together with an engineer, an aviation mechanical engineer called Philip Watts and they investigated this and produced a paper on it. What they found was the nodules actually concentrate the areas of lift between the nodules and both increase lift and decrease drag and it's significant in the region of 15 to 20 percent which is huge of course what they did was make a patent on it the patents are funny things incidentally one of the things a patent doesn't cover 
is private use. You can do this as long as it's non-commercial or you can do it for education and research papers. Patents protect commercial use. So putting it into a patent means for private use anybody can do this and that made me think okay what about if I stick some of those nodules or tubercles along this shape seeing as this shape is so much like a whale's fin would that give me an improvement and of course the first step is to stick a load of tubercles on which is exactly what I've done here now of course I'm going to update the file in Thingiverse and add this as an extra print if somebody else wants to test it and see whether it works or not but I've printed this off now let's print off three more and the nose cone there we are with exactly the same structure, nose cone, two of the fins on and a handle so I can hold it, a bit of steel rod going through two bearings and it's free to spin in the wind. So we put those on in the same way that we put this on in, and we have two of those and now we can have a sort of side by side comparison. So to test that we've come to a hill near where I live because we get a reasonable amount of wind. I mean there isn't a lot of wind today anyway but we'll do that test and the test is going to be pretty simple. We're going to hold the two up together in a wind and see which one turns soonest and which one turns quickest and that will give us an idea of whether this is BS or not. Okay, I understand that was a little equivocal, I mean we're standing on a hill with a couple of these things, but there is a lot of research in this already, so some more facts and figures I guess we can refer to the paper, but as far as I can tell, it certainly seems to have an impact. So we might try that on a whole host of things like this, which is the Ingenuity Blade. We could try a load of cubicles on there, or we could try it on just a standard blade setup and see what happens, or we could put it on a VAWT where we put the nodules, the tubercles down there to see if we get an improvement from that. Now, the inventors of this say that it's much broader than just wind turbines. You can also look at things like uh, water turbines. You should get an improvement there. And they say that if you stick it on something like a PC fan, it makes the fan quieter and more efficient. So it's a very exciting development, well worth an awful lot of looking into. Should anybody feel like picking up and having a look at that as well and see what we can come up with. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the videos. Oh, by the way, when they um, put something onto Thingiverse, Thingiverse have this really weird policy that just started. Um, it's 24 hours of checking time. So I've been putting up the Thingiverse file and the video at the same time. Now there's a 24 hour wait before the Thingiverse files go live, which is annoying, but just the way it is. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Thank you very much for watching. Please do remember to like and subscribe.